Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our Diversity 2020 Spotlight Panel. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here today. Uh, I'm Karen Corrigan. I serve on the Board of Directors as Chair of the Board for the Muse Writers Center in Norfolk, Virginia. And we're delighted that you could join us uh, for today's reading. Uh, this is the second in a series of virtual events that will make up our Diversity 2020 Dynamic Voices for Change program. And uh, I hope you'll go to our website at themuse.org and check out that program. It's, uh, it's an exciting one that will uh, go uh, for the next several weeks into November. Um, do want to let you know that every fall since 2016, the Muse has held an annual Book Lovers Bash. Uh, this is a fundraiser that celebrates the literary arts, uh, brings together writers um, from all over um, our uh, community and beyond. Uh, this year, in light of the pandemic, uh, we decided to cancel the event, as you can imagine, and host uh, this dynamic series, um, programs like you will see tonight instead. So we're very excited. Uh, we're here again to celebrate the literary arts and really showcase these wonderful writers, uh, such as the poets that you'll hear a little later this evening. Oh, I think we lost Karen there. She's frozen. Is she frozen for everyone else? I think I can finish that off. Um, where we were before, I, I can't remember exactly where she was, but I will tell you that we're having lots of great performances coming up by, for Diversity 2020. Do we get that far, Louisa? Yeah? Okay, great. And uh, we will uh, continue to um, show these, uh, show uh, all of these uh, programs all the way through November. Um, they're all free. We're taking uh, donations for the Muse Writers Center, but also tonight we are also taking donations for um, Urban Word NYC. If you look at our Facebook page, there's links to that below this video, and also there's links to this below on our uh, our website event page as well. And they're on the main Diversity 2020 page, which is on the-muse.org under events. So I'm really excited about this event. I want you to uh, keep uh, watching. And did we talk about the muse, Louisa? Did uh, Karen talk about the muse? Yes? Starting to, but I can pick up a little bit of that. Okay, great. So I'm gonna turn it over to Louisa. And Louisa, Karen had your bio written down on her. <laughs> I will tell you that, to, I will tell you that uh, Louisa A. Gloria is on our board at the Muse Writer Center, but she teaches at Old Dominion University. Um, she uh, she is also a wonderful poet, and she is the now the uh, poet laureate of Virginia, and we're really excited about that. And she deserves it so much. And she's also won tons of awards. I had them written down, but I gave them to to Karen, so I can't say them all. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Louisa. Maybe Karen will be back at the end. Okay. Thank you so much, Louisa. All right. Thank you, friends, for joining us in Hampton Roads. It's a bright and cool. Saturday afternoon. Uh, I'm just here to be fangirl to all of our wonderful guests this afternoon. Thank you for being here. I also want to thank all the people who helped make this particular program possible. So thank you, Sean Gervin and our Muse interns and our behind the scenes staff for all the wonderful help throughout the planning and getting this series going. And I want to name them by name, Susan Deutsch, Rebecca Coxwell, Kimberly Ammons, Sierra Foltz, and Gabriela Igloria. And thank you to Dr. Kamea Davis and to Urban Word New York, uh, who, who has helped us to bring our third speaker uh, for this program. As Karen said earlier, please consider making a donation to the Muse, which has served our Hampton Roads community over the last almost two decades to bring a variety of short-term courses at all levels in writing and creativity to our communities. And the Muse, as it says on our website, is committed to not turning anyone away. And so we really rely on your generosity, the generosity of sponsors, donors, to help us keep our promise to our community, communities as we grow writers and artists in our midst. So uh, it is my great honor to introduce our readers this afternoon. I will be doing so in turn, and then they will read maybe you know three or four 
poems, uh, and then I'll come back and introduce the next reader. And at the end, we'll have a little opportunity for some conversation and the audience may type in their questions um, in the, uh, I'm not sure, in the Facebook page, uh, wherever there's a space for questions, please ask questions and we will read them out and we will try to address as many as we can uh, given the time constraints or time remaining. So the first reader, first writer I'd like to introduce this afternoon is January Gill O'Neill. In her most recent book aptly called Rewilding, she proposes the idea that there are things in our lives, in the very world itself, that need to return to their basic, honest nature. But what does it mean to make something wild again? What has happened to the life we knew before this moment? And how do you get up every morning in a world constantly threatening to swallow us, our children, and our ecosystems? So I go to Jan's poems in order to try and find solace for myself too, as I grapple with such questions. But I also want to say Jan is no stranger to Hampton Roads. She earned her BA at Old Dominion University and her MFA from New York University, a Cavic Hannum Fellow and Executive Director of the Massachusetts Poetry Festival. Her honors include a Patterson Award for Literary Excellence and the Mass Books Poetry Award from the Massachusetts Center for the Book. Jan is also a board member of the AWP, the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, and she has many, many other honors that I could not possibly list them all uh, today, but I'm, I'm very excited to hear uh, what she has brought to us today. And so welcome, Jan. Thanks, Louisa. Uh, and thank you to the Muse and all the folks behind the scenes. Thanks to Ross. Um, I'm thrilled, and I was saying this offline, but you know, I wish we had the muse when I was at ODU, um, you know, and I grew up in Norfolk and I love Hampton Rose and I get down every chance I get. My parents are still in Norfolk. So um, depending on what's going on with COVID, I'm hoping to come back in the near future. So I'm gonna read four poems. Um, I'm gonna hop around a bit. Uh, it felt like uh, we had a rainy morning and uh, it's now sunny and the leaves are changing. So I'm gonna read an October poem. The Blower of Leaves. Always there is sky after sky waiting to fall. A million brilliant ambers twisting in the thinning October sun, flooding my eyes in a curtain of color. My yard is their landing strip. Today I bow to the power of negative space, the beauty of what's missing, the hard work of yard work made harder without you while the stiff kiss of acorns puckers the ground. I am a fool. Even as the red impatience wither and brown, they are still lovely. I feed the gaping mouths of lawn bags with their remains. All this time, I was waiting for a heavy bough to crush us high above, but really I was waiting for you to say enough. It was a feeling that swirled inside me, a dark congruence, a tempest of the blood pulsing, enough, enough. How I had mistaken it for ordinary happiness. I can forgive the wind rustling the aging oaks, the clusters of leaf mush trapped along the fence line, but with you, there is no forgiveness, only refuse, only the lawns dying clover and weeds masquerading as grass. Nothing is ever easy or true except the leaves. They all fall, dependable as a season. And so I'll read uh, two poems from Misery Islands. Oh, that was Misery Islands, that was my first book. I'll read two poems from um, Rewilding, which it feels odd to read Rewilding. I wonder if I had published this book uh, later, I wonder how different it would be uh, with all that's going on in the world. This one's for my son. The Rookie. America under the lights at Harry Ball Field. A fog rolls in and the flag crinkles and drapes around a metal pole. 
my son reaches into the sky to pull down a game ender, a bomb caught in his leather mitt. He gives the ball a flat squeeze, then tosses it in from the outfield, tugs his cap over a tussle of hair before joining the team. All high fives and handshakes as the major boys line up at home plate. They are learning how to be good sports. Their dugout cheers interrupted only by sunflower seed shells spat along the first baseline. The coach prattles on about the importance of stealing bases and productive outs, while a teammate cracks a joke about my son's fro, then says, but you're not really black. To which there's laughter, to which he smiles, but says nothing, which says something about what goes unsaid, what starts as a harmless joke, routine as a can of corn. But this is Little League. This is where he learns how to field a position, how to play a bloop in the gap, that impossible space where he always plays defense. And so since we're living in interesting times, um, uh, I thought I would read uh, this one. Um, a while back when I was at a party, somebody told me I looked like our former first lady. So um, I'm going to read this poem on being told I look like Flotus, New Year's Eve party, 2014. Deep in my biceps, I know it's a compliment. Just as I know this is an all black people look alike moment. So I use the minimal amount of muscles to crack a smile. All night, he catches sight of me, or someone like me, standing next to the deconstructed cannoli and empty bottles of Prosecco. And in that moment, I understand how little right any of us have to be whomever we are. The constant tension of making our way in this world on hope and change. You're working your muscles to the point of failure, Michelle Obama once said about her workout regimen. But she knows we wear our history in our darkness, in our patience. A compliment is a compliment, this I know, just as the clock will always strike midnight and history repeats. This is how I can wake up the next morning and love the world again. And I'll finish with a relatively new one. This past um, year, I was um, a fellow at the University of Mississippi in Oxford. Mississippi. And uh, it was a great experience to, to step away from my normal teaching schedule and, and Massachusetts life and, and live in the Deep South uh, for nine months. And so uh, a lot of my writing was centered around um, race relations and Emmett Till and, and, and um, music and everything good and not so great about the South. Um, and then COVID struck and then I had to stop a lot of my research. Um, so this is the last poem I wrote uh, when I was in Mississippi and um, it was printed in an anthology called Alone, uh, Alone Together, uh, Love, Grief and Comfort in the Time of COVID. And so I'm constantly wondering in this time, um, if I write um, a poem in this time is it a COVID poem because I am writing during a pandemic or because I'm choosing to write about a particular subject? But this one I actually did write uh, about what was happening. This poem is called Glitter Road. I'll take my miracles however they appear these days. A salamander poking its head above the bricks, the shocking blue overcoat of the season's first bluebird, a spider web unbroken. At the corner of Molly Ball and McElroy, I saw a thick trail of glitter in the curve of a right turn lane. Fuchsia, heavy shimmer refracting the noonday sun as if laying flat a rainbow's extracted hue. Not paint or blood or parade shedding its cheer. It's the faded streak of eyeshadow as it trails and flecks, then disappears. I think of cars 
passing through this moment, their undercarriages aglow with possibility. Hard not to feel good, riding a glistening wave, my tires now bespeckled with a purple sheen that's tough to rid or wash away. The road ahead made beautiful by this temporary shine. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. Uh, that's one of the anthologies that I have on my list to get. Um, and yeah, what an absolutely uh, thoughtful question that is. Is everything that we write now a COVID poem or a COVID piece? And it's hard not to think of how it couldn't be so at the same time that it isn't also. So anyway, um, we'll talk later, but now it is my honor to introduce our next speaker. And I just, uh, maybe as a form of introduction, um, I was just teaching uh, the poem about the, fig, the wonderful fig tree on the corner of Ninth and Christian again last week in my introduction to creative writing class. So I asked questions like, what do you do when the feather of delight comes tapping? Do you shut your ears or open the window to see what is calling from the weeds? But if you're Ross Gay, you catalog these wonders, by which I mean you turn your attention to even the invisible presences that make fruit ripen as well as ferment, by which I mean I would like to try and explain the kind of magic that happens in a Ross Gay poem or essay, but I can't because I am merely a mushroom spore in the vast galaxy of this garden. So I can tell you though that Ross teaches at Indiana University, has fellowships from Kaveh Kanem, the Bread Loaf Writers Conference and the Guggenheim Foundation, and is the author of four amazing books of poetry. Uh, and the most recent one is, uh, has just come out um, in September, was it September? Yes, Beholding, just released from the University of Pittsburgh Press. Uh, and a collection of essays, The Book of Delights is where he documents his you know, delights in the world around us and you read one a day and you feel like it's taking vitamins, but <laughs> the best kind. So in addition to being a founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, a nonprofit free, free fruit for all food justice and joy project, Ross also works on the Tenderness Project with Shayla Lawson and Essence London. So, so happy to have you here. Ross, welcome. Thank you very much, Louisa. Really good to be with you all. Jan, good to be with you. That um, intro is like, you got it. <laughs> you, you, you got it. You nailed it. <laughs> that mushroom spore, I love that one. Um, so I'm going to read a couple pieces. Um, yeah, I'm really glad to be with you today. It feels nice. Um, feels lucky, grateful. This is called Ode to Buttoning and Unbuttoning My Shirt. And often when I read this, I don't actually have a shirt with buttons because I only have a couple. And here it is. I'm wearing a shirt with buttons. Ode to Buttoning and Unbuttoning My Shirt. No one knew, or at least I didn't know they knew, what the thin discs threaded here on my shirt might give me in terms of joy. This is not something to be taken lightly. The gift of buttoning one's shirt slowly, top to bottom or bottom to top, or sometimes the buttons will be on the other side and I'm a woman that morning, slipping the glass through its slot. I tread differently that day or some of it anyway. My conversations are different and the car bomb slicing the air and the people in it for a quarter mile and the honeybee's legs furred with pollen mean another thing to me than on the other days, which too have been grizzled in this simplest of joys, in this world of spaceships and subatomic this and that, two, maybe three times a day some days, I have the distinct pleasure of slowly untethering the one side from the other, which is like unbuckling a stack of vertebrae with delicacy for I must only use the tips of my fingers with which I will one day close my mother's eyes. This is as delicate as we can be in this life, practicing like this, giving the raft of our hands to the clumsy spider and blowing soft until she lifts her damp heft and crawls off. We practice like this, pushing the seed into the earth like this, first in the morning, then at night, we practice sliding the bones home. And uh, 
I'm gonna read this essay, a uh, little essay from the, the Book of Delights. And um, yeah, so this is just um, several short essays, mostly short essays about um, where the question is, you know, I'm sort of trying to document every day something that delights me and think about it. And this is the delight this day is ambiguous signage sometimes. <laughs> ambiguous signage sometimes. I do not want to be the kind of person who feels superior or is irritated or God forbid sneers at a sign that has a typo or a grammatical error, especially if that sign is not in an English department. I have a feeling you know what I mean. I come from a family of educators, many of them black educators from whom my father, not a black educator officially, but unofficially inherited the reflex of correcting often ironically this child's speech. Me, dad, can I have a quarter? Dad, I don't know, can you? Me, I don't understand. The lesson, as you know, is may I, a lesson I never ever demonstrate having learned unless I'm speaking with a British accent. But what I've learned is the worry one might have about one's child, perhaps most especially one's black or brown child, speaking improper English, wearing improper colors, having improper etiquette, or displaying improper taste, which in the case of my dad and me, really meant behaving in the style or manner of black people, the idea of black people, which really meant one's black or brown child being perceived as the idea of black people, the, the prospect of which for my father though I never heard him say it plainly, must have been a terror. Let me pause here to recommend Margot Jefferson's brilliant book, Negro Land, which explains my father ejecting my NWA 100 miles and running tape from the boom box and dropping it in the trash. A performative gesture, really, meaning something between you aren't running from anything and you're gonna be running from my foot up your ass but one that imprinted on me as I was keeping it real by digging through my spoogy tissues to retrieve easy E in French. You will run less if you know how to say may I, he actually meant, and don't even think about ain't. It is not too much to say, and the older I get, the more I understand it's really not too much to say, that he was trying to keep us alive physically and psychically by inuring us to the many registers of hatred overt and subtle, leveled at black people. He was trying to make our blackness or the idea of our blackness invisible, which he must have known was not quite possible. My father could be viciously protective, like the time he nearly murdered the posse of teenage skinheads in our apartment complex who pinned me to the ground and held a cigarette up to my face, or was about to stomp into oblivion the dog that charged me when we were delivering the piggyback shopper but my favorite, I think, was when he was with me in Humeville Municipal Court, where I was to defend myself against trespassing charges, a citation or something, for I had been sledding in the wrong place and was handcuffed and put into the back of the squad car. And when I lied to the judge, my favorite lines, and when I lied to the judge, <laughs> telling him I never saw any trespassing signs along the route to Fireman's Hill, the cop asked, can you read? My father answered for me, yes, he can read, in a tone that meant motherfucker. This essay might as well be called The Tangent, for I mostly thought I would talk about, but will instead end on, this delightful sign in the room where I'm staying, just to the side of the mantle, which somehow feels relevant to the conversation. It reads like a haiku, fireplace out of order, thank you. And I'm gonna read one more poem, a little, a little longer. This is called Opera Singer. Today, my heart is so goddamn fat with grief that I've begun hauling it in a wheelbarrow. No, it's an anvil dragging from my neck as I swim through choppy waters swollen with the putrid corpses of hippos, which means lurking somewhere below is the hungry snout of a croc waiting to spin me into an oblivion worse than this run-on simile. 
which means only to say, I'm sad. And everyone knows what that means. And in my sadness, I'll walk to a cafe and not see light in the trees or finger the bills in my pocket as I pass the boarded houses on the block. No, I will be slogging through the obscure country of my sadness in all its monotone flourish. And so imagine my surprise when my self-absorption gets usurped by the sound of opera streaming from an open window. And the sun peaks ever so slightly from behind his shawl, and this singing is getting closer so that I can hear the delicately rolled R's like a hummingbird fluttering the tongue, which means a language more beautiful than my own. And I don't recognize the song, though I am jogging toward it. And I can hear the woman's breathing through the record's imperfections. And above me, two bluebirds dive and dart, and a rogue mulberry branch leaning over an abandoned lot drags itself across my face, staining it purple. And looking now like a mad warrior of glee and relief, I run down the street. And I forgot to mention, there are 50 or so kids running behind me, some in diapers, some barefoot, all of them winged and waving their pacifiers and training wheels and nearly trampling me when in a doorway, I see a woman in slippers and a floral house dress blowing in the warm breeze, who is maybe 70, painting the doorway and friends, it is not too much to say it was heaven sailing from her mouth and all the fish in the sea, and giraffe saunter, and sugar in my tea, and the forgotten angles of love, and every name of the unborn and dead from this abuelita only glancing at me, before turning back to her earnest work of brushstroke and lullaby. And because we all know the tongue's clumsy thudding makes of miracles anecdotes, let me stop here and tell you I said thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ross. Uh, that story in your, that moment in your essay about Ken and May, I just suddenly remembered a similar incident when I was growing up and I, I went to a Catholic elementary school where the rules were so rigid, we could not even speak in the vernacular. Um, we were fined five centavos for every word that we did not speak in English during the school hours. So the can and may thing, you know, I remember children hopping on one foot saying, can I go to the bathroom? And the teacher saying, no, yes, you can, or yes, you can, but you may not. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, this, this whole idea of language also um, kind of opening up this field of prohibition, this grammar of, uh, you know, um, prohibition, which did, anyway, thank you for also bringing back that memory and yeah, yeah, yeah. To connect to it in that way. Um, we are uh, still figuring out uh, if our third reader has a little bit of difficulty joining, but maybe in the meantime, I can ask you um, this question that I, I've heard a lot of people being interested in, especially since the pandemic happened to all of us. And I know that people are doing all these tallies or countdowns. They're saying how many days since the pandemic? And if you start counting from around mid-March, that's about 20, 216 days. And they say things like how many days till the November election and it's 17, I guess. So, uh, I mean, the sense of time, the sense of time passing, the sense of time either being very slow or very fast. How do you as poets um, fill your days now? And is there a difference? And how do you, what do you bring to it that um, varies or that doesn't change? What are the things that, that are sort of touch posts for you from day to day, maybe? I'll take, I, I'll give it a shot. Well, I, you know, I, my days are, I mean, they're just weird. I, I describe this time as just an odd time and we're all going through it. And, um, you know, half the time I'm really, you know, kind of thankful to have, you know, just everybody slow down a little bit. I mean, my kids are teenagers and we're all at home uh, you know, and they're starting to do hybrid. So sometime in school and sometime at home, but we're here a lot. Um, and uh, me teaching at home is new and I'm teaching four classes. So um, I, I find myself busy, exhausted, 
thankful, amazed just to be able to walk outside and, you know, trying to look at the world anew, you know, trying new things. My daughter just baked, you know, bread today. So, you know, I'm thankful for a lot of things that are going on during this period. And as far as writing goes, it comes and goes. I was a little more productive before the, the academic year started. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying because I think this time isn't going to go away, <laughs> at least, you know, for the foreseeable future. I think we're going to be in this, you know, this, this, this world for a little bit longer. And so um, waiting for it to end and then starting to write again is not going to work. So I'm trying to figure out some sort of a rhythm where I'm writing at least every week, you know, and documenting this time. I'm trying to... Um, uh, impress that upon my students that this this we're all going through this and I think everybody's voice is important and I think we need to document this time and however that looks so if people are writing they should write if they're making music or being creative they should do that we should have markers of this time yeah that's I agree Ross what about you what do you do I um you know I'm teaching so I have um kind of a, a little bit of a schedule with um, my teaching and sort of, um, you know, meeting with students and stuff. Um, I do feel like it is, yeah, time is a different, I remember like in April or whatever, feeling like just the strangeness of the, of the time itself. Like, you know, how, how the day, like, you know, the, I guess one of the things that, you know, if, if you were slowed way down, um, like I was, um, how, how organizing, like psychically, my day is around other people, around interaction, and around touch, too, you know. Um, and so it, it, it was and is remains a kind of puzzle, like how you know, time, and I don't, I don't even know how to talk about it yet, except to be like, oh, yeah. Um, but one thing I did find in terms of my sort of writing life is that I was really drawn to, um, I'm always drawn to collaboration, but I realized like even maybe more so. And so immediately, um, almost immediately, you know, a couple of um, folks, students here and I started writing these sort of poems together and, um, couple other people and I started like doing these collaborations and my inclination was to figure, you know, my inclination, I think it's more and more my inclination in making period is to make stuff with other people. Um, and I think that was one of the ways that I felt like, um, I don't know if the word is able to make or interested in making, I mean, interested, I felt very interested in making stuff with other people. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of how yeah. I like like jamming right yeah 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 exactly yeah, yeah. Exactly. just or improvising yeah. improvising playing yeah. yeah yeah are you doing any new collaborations yeah i'm in a um i mean i'm collaborating with um someone who i was playing basketball with for for years and, and we're writing essays back and forth so we're working on a project and um i'm working on a project with a friend of mine uh, a theater director named Brooke O'Hara. We're working on a project together. And we also, in my classes, we, um, you know, like right now I'm thinking a little bit of like, I, I have to, me and a couple other students have to make a movie for class for Tuesday because I give all of these <laughs> wacky assignments where people gotta like collaborate and like make a movie where the sycamore tree is the protagonist and this and <laughs> this and that. So I'm like, yeah, tomorrow at two o'clock, I'm meeting two people and we're gonna like try to film this movie. <laughs> so in my teaching too, there's, you know, I always kind of try to encourage collaboration in my teaching or, mm -hmm. or require it, but mm -hmm. even more maybe. Yeah, I think for you too, Jen, are your students also more interested in that kind of thing now? They are, um, I teach undergraduates and, you know, they they all seem to come to, to class and wanna be engaged. I mean, I wasn't sure what I would, would get. I mean, it's a little tough when everybody, well, half of the class, you know, blacks out their screen mm -hmm. and I get, you know, that's a little hard, but um, they're, they're as engaged as ever. And I'm trying to do my part to, to, you know, how can you bring a community together that's not 
acting like a community, not because they don't want to, just because they can't. So um, I'm encouraging them to, you know, to work together and try projects together and writing assignments together. I'm also encouraging them to, you know, it, there's so many readings out right now because we can't travel, you know, mm -hmm. we're at home and we're all, we have Zoom, we can go anywhere. Right. So, you know, right. I've made that a part of my class. Right. Um, but yeah, I, it, it is, it's, it's an interesting time. And, and the, what I'm getting back though, I've made, I've made this time, I've, I've wanted them to talk about, I figured, you know, when they came back in this per, the first time, they really had a chance to talk about, to write about, to think about it. Uh, so, so I, I've sort of made it a part of their class to, you know, what is it like, you know, to have a prompt about masks and, you know, what does that, what does that do to us, you know? You know, when I, one of the things I noticed with the mask that, you know, you can't really tell if people are smiling or not. So that's my experience. So trying to pull some of that and really have them, you know, go deep about what it means and how it's symbolic of how everything has changed. So, yeah. I'm, and I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do projects where they, um, that makes sense for them remotely. And so that's getting more and connecting on email and such. Right. And, you know, we have a lot of teachers who are watching us this afternoon because the Muse is also a community of writing teachers, creative writing teachers. And there are a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, Cindy is asking, well, Ross, but also maybe Jan can also answer later. Uh, would you talk about the distinction between gratitude and delight? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, and I also want to say about teaching, I think writing letters these days, yeah. um, writing letters is between students, like as, a, as an exercise, um, between all of us, post, postal service, wonderful. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, yeah, so Delight, um, you know, it's funny, when I wrote that book, I wrote these essays about Delight for the whole year. Um, and I'd never looked up the word delight and I am kind of the kind of person who's into um, etymology and all that. So it was a friend of mine who actually was like, hey, uh, wrote me a letter on my birthday, the last day and explained to me what delight was, <laughs> etymology of delight. So I, it's funny cause I kind of knew what it meant but I didn't quite. But one of the things that I, my feeling about delight is that it is this sort of, um, um, you know, I wonder if I'll say it in the negative first. So delight is not joy to me. Delight is a sort of, you know, something that's occasioned maybe by something, you know, whatever, I don't even know, but it's, it, joy is sort of a more grave. Um, and when I say grave, informed by the fact that we will die, um, that we are in the midst of our dying. And what we love is also in the midst of dying. Um, and, and the sort of ways that we hold one another, perhaps ideally, um, and enter the holding of one another in the midst of that, to me feels like joy. The feeling that when we do sort of um, submit to and enter into the kind of entanglement that I believe is actually present, um, not only among, um, you know, human animals, but among all of, all of the all, um, that to me feels like joy. And kind of right to the side of that, or maybe in the same sort of thing, is when we sort of acknowledge, when we acknowledge that our entanglements and our debts, are, our indebtedness is complete and absolute, that we do not live, you know, there's no such thing as, as um, independence. There's no such thing as freedom. There's no such thing as self-sufficiency. <laughs> You, it, it, we are perpetually and always reliant and indebted upon our lives. The very fact of our lives are constantly, we rely on the benevolence of so much. And you might just call it the earth. Um, but you know, like the microbes in my stomach at this moment are keeping me alive. If they go wrong, it's, it's like that, you know, I will never meet them except to be like, thank you. <laughs> you know, the trees on this planet are keeping us alive. They go away, it's like that, you know, and on and on and on and on. So to me, gratitude, and I mean real gratitude, um, I'm not, you know, it's like profound gratitude to me feels like, um, like joy, like a kind of submission and understanding and entering into the full 
deep understanding of our absolute entanglement and our absolute um, indebtedness mm. for our lives, for mm. everything and for our lives. I love the way you just put that, the absolute debt and absolute entanglement in our, I guess, co-relationships with everything. Because we, when we think of the word debt, we usually think of it in that sort of model, which is built around the concept of penury, yeah. or you owe someone and you know, you're know you in trouble if you don't pay off your debts. But this is a different kind of sense that I'm getting from that idea of an entanglement that is so absolute that we can't you know work ourselves free of that and, and survive. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can't Amazing. work ourselves free of it. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I feel like practices of gratitude are, um, and I'm thinking of like a couple, like um, Robin Wall Kimmerer writes about this so beautifully. And um, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney um, write about debt so beautifully. And this way of that, it's so, it uh, goes against the kind of whatever our weird notions, our capitalist, you know, world destroying notions. <laughs> <laughs> are but the idea of like you know we're more comfortable being in debt to a bank say um than we are to ex to be like in debt to each other you know mm -hmm. um, some kind of but but i've been thinking as practices of gratitude what i want to do is actually build my debt and i want to express my debt and honor my debt you know be in yeah. need as you know something like elevating and honoring our need yeah, yeah. Know, right. which is there and just yeah. like that's it's my life. I need right. right. Jan, did you want to address it too? I don't know. That's pretty good. But I will say, um, you know, there's something about our interconnectedness that, you know, Ross is talking about that makes sense and, you know, lends itself to gratitude. And certainly in a time like this, when we've had to slow down and take stock of our lives and figure out what's important, I certainly wake up with a newer, deeper sense of gratitude, you know, knowing that, um, you know, my immediate circle is healthy and happy and, um, you know, that I get to do what I love to do, um, you know, which is write and be a mom and all those good things. So, yeah. All right. Okay. We have a question from Kendra uh, McDonald, who is our, one of our muse teachers, also a poet. I'd like to hear Ross talk about the process of writing essays longhand with pen and paper versus sitting at a computer and writing and if that changes your writing process at all and also in regard to poems. Yeah, I feel like um, in there's an essay in there. Um, so I gave myself three rules for that book and it was to write by hand, to write every day and to write quickly. So I wrote those essays in 30 minutes or less. I drafted them in 30 minutes or less. less. Um, I, you know, I, in, in this essay where I talk about writing by hand, I quote Susan Sontag, who I think I have this right, who said something like, whatever makes you write slower, try to do that. Um, and I kind of, and I, and I, I like that as an idea. Um, I kind of believe that as an idea. Um, writing by hand also, like, to me, it reminds me that the act of writing, which I think of as the act of thinking, is actually a bodily process. Mm -hmm. So that I think with my body and writing by hand reminds me that I am thinking with my body. And I feel firmly that if I'm writing a pencil, I will think differently than if I'm writing with a pen. And if I'm writing with a la pen, I will write differently than if I'm writing with a big ballpoint pen. And, and then differently than if I'm writing by a typewriter, which is also another kind of technology that requires a different kind of embodiment, a kind of embodiment though. Um, so that's one of the things like to me, I, because I, because I think of writing as thinking and I think of writing as embodied thinking, I think to do it with, uh, with the hand in motion and kind of dancing on the page, um, feeling something, you know, feeling and hearing the sound, uh, of the, of the writing implement on the page and feeling the pull, the pull of the paper against the, or the pull of the instrument against the paper. Um, that informs my thinking in a way that feels uh, mm -hmm. important to me. The other thing is that something that feels like such a, a sorrow, you know, not like a big sorrow, but like a sorrow is that the computer make allows us to revise and eliminate all of this sort of 
all of the mess that we do in order to get to where we thought. And there's something to me just so beautiful in reading, like if I looked at either of your drafts, your handwritten drafts, I would be so interested in all of the mess. I imagine there's mess. And I'm interested in the mess. And the, the computer allows us to just eliminate the mess so that it never, you can't even see the kind of, the history of our thinking. I think the history of our thinking is really beautiful. And yeah, and uh, we were just talking about that, well, with my online class, so it's an asynchronous class. So talking through words, of course, mediated by the computer, but I was just saying something about how some poets or some writers don't even keep the drafts that they go through anymore. So it's always the most recent thing. So it's kind of like a reverse palimpsest, except every every layer is like it's just gone into some void and you don't know where it is it's yeah. kind of weird and scary mm -hmm. do you do you write in with your uh, pens or pencils and notebooks still jen yeah i I've, I've sort of my process has changed but um i you know I, i'll it all strikes me by how i'm feeling that day and so if I roll over and, you know, write something bad, then yeah, I do it by pen. Um, uh, you know, if I have a chance later in the day, I'll, I'll type it up. I've been trying to write a poem a day uh, during the pandemic, but I haven't been doing that. I was wondering, Lisa, do you still, I remember a while back, you, were, you said you write every day. You try to write a poem a day or like you, you have a streak going. <laughs> so, I still do. I still do. It's almost 10 years now in November. I will yeah. Yeah, a day for I think we should celebrate that. It's amazing. I, I can barely, you know, I, I try I, at this point, I'll be happy if I can write something every week. But I find myself as part of the process is, you know, as I'm walking, as I'm, um, you know, doing, you know, some of the other tasks around the house, refining, you know, whatever I've come up with in the morning. Mm -hmm. The key is to remember to sit down and, and get it on the page. And I actually computer, uh, you know, putting it on the PC or laptop, that's sort of like another stage of editing. So if yeah. I sit down, I mean, there's a lot there. Ross, there's a lot of mess in my writing. <laughs> and I mean, it needs to be a good thing. It's not a perfect thing. No, it's not, the no, goal but, is not perfection at all. But it is, it is interesting to keep four or five drafts of something and then, you know, go back and pull something that may have worked, you know, didn't work. Yeah but kind of can work later. So it is a history of a thought pattern in a way. Right, right. And let's see how a poem starts, you know, with just maybe a small concept and it turns into either exactly what I thought or nothing like what I thought. Oh, it yourself before. completely in a different direction. Yeah. I have to run to the bathroom. I'm going to be back in one second. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, Ross has his garden. I, I think the, the daily poem for me yeah. is that that's just where I go dig up weeds and, you know, yeah, um, uh, aerate the soil. What is what is the gardening term for that? Aerate. Right. I think aerate I is right. Figure out, you know, you can, ask, the, you can ask Ross when he comes back. I think that's right. Um, right. I, have leaned, the soil. I have leaned more in the gardening, uh, probably not as much as either of you two, but I, I am doing my best, uh, you know, and, and the garden is a source of um, wonderment and growth. And, you know, just like everybody else, with a little more time on their hands, I've been trying to do more of that myself. So um, it, it is, it's part of the process. And I, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think we have time for one more question. And, you know, Ross can answer. <laughs> in the but, and this is actually hitting at the general question that I wanted to bring in front of all of you from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa says uh, from the audience, I think poetry is even more needed and appreciated now more than ever. And do you feel the same way and how maybe? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, yeah, I think poetry has always been appreciated, but it's always been appreciated by a small few. Uh, so, uh, but now I feel like we have so much attention you know, extra attention to give it. I think people, you know, they've slowed down. So um, I know that poetry over the years, uh, the numbers seem to be increasing, which is great. But I, I, I do, I, I, you know, I, I think we're seeing it more and more in pop culture. I think we're seeing it, 
you know, uh, shared and it's, it's certainly shareable, you know, on Instagram and, and Twitter and other social media outlets. So I do, but I, I always think the poetry comes back to connection and people mm -hmm. want to connect, mm -hmm. um, you know, so for every, you know, somebody out there who might make fun of it, because there's always somebody who does, I'll find two or three who, you know, who will comment me on, comment uh, on something I've written or ask me about, um, you know, poems that they saw or, you know, uh, so I think it, it, and these are people who are not writers normally, so. Um, right, yeah. yeah. Well, Roz, I was asking, um, because this came in from the audience, do you think that the current climate is even more than ever conducive to poetry? Why is it, why is poetry even more necessary now? And uh, somebody had asked me, I can't remember if it was an interview or some other uh, Zoom kind of thing like this. And what do you say to the poetry deniers? You know, just like the climate <laughs> or science deniers. What do you say to the poetry deniers? What's your answer to them? <laughs> I just say, okay. <laughs> 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 to me, because I'm kind of like, you know, I'm always, I'm always, I'm not on the, um, on the worried about poetry thing ever because I'm like every time I go to a wedding, every time I go to a funeral, every time I go to some big thing, there's always some kind of poem, you know. And um, so, but I do feel like moments where I was trying to articulate this um, not too long ago, but like moments where there's a kind of we need to be able to articulate, among other things, the mystery. We need people, we need ways that the mystery mm -hmm. can be kind of held and articulated. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like poetry does that, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know, that it seems like people are reaching for or talking mm -hmm. about or thinking about or moved by poems in ways um, when often when they're needing a kind of language right. for what is right. beyond mm -hmm. language in a certain kind of way. Yeah. Right. And, and I, let me just add that I don't think poetry is for everybody, nor should it be, you know, just like classical music is not for everybody or pottery is not for everybody. It's okay if not everybody likes it. I think poetry is durable and it will be around forever and uh, new people will come in and, and, and write things that we have never thought about before. And, you know, mm -hmm. we'll have our masters that we'll go back to generation after generation and it will be here. It will just, it's, it's just here. It's here. Yeah, and sometimes it's not even about being able to figure out where the mystery of something that has moved us, you know, comes from or can be explained. I think just the fact that we can be moved still is the amazing thing that we can be and should be grateful for every time we can feel that way. Mm -hmm. And so thank you to you who make us feel that mm -hmm. way a lot of the time. So thank you so much for being here. Um, if there's any other words of advice or wisdom that you can share with our writing community here, uh, we would love it before we say our farewells and thank yous. Well, well, thank you to you, Luisa and the Muse and, and providing spaces for writers and um, audiences to connect. That's so important. Um, you know, I will just add that it's, it's easier now more than ever to find poetry. Um, there are some big organizations as well as small ones that do poems a day, podcasts. Um, you know, if you're going to stare at your phone for five minutes, stare at a poem. So, yeah, I also want to say thank you. I'm just um, grateful for places where we're able to like get together. Yeah. However, whatever it looks like, I'm just grateful. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you for your generosity, both of you and everybody out there. Take your poetry vitamins every day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cheesy That's little. Right. Yes. And let me turn the virtual stage over to uh, Karen. I think it's going to say close the program. Thank you, Ross. Thank, Thank you, Jen. Thank you. I Thank look you. To the time we can sit down and have coffee and commune. And face to face. Face to face. Yes. face. yes. All right. Oh, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louisa. And uh, thank you, uh, Ross and January. I so enjoyed that. And it's wonderful to 
not only that you share your wonderful work with everybody, but taking the uh, time and being willing to share, allow us to have insight into the way you're thinking and your process and uh, the meaning of, uh, of the works that you do is uh, important and, and meaningful to all of us. And on behalf of the Muse Writers Center, I want to say thank you to everyone who has uh, watched this uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's such a joy uh, for us to be able to share poetry and art with people all over the world, and, and we so appreciate you being here. Um, if you would like to donate to support the Muse or become a sponsor for this Diversity 2020 series, uh, you can click the link in the event description and uh, that will take you to give you more information about how to do that. I do want to let you know that the next event in the series is a live zine workshop at 3.30 p.m. on November 7th. Uh, so be sure to check out um, that. Uh, you can check out the artist's websites. You can look at our featured organizations and learn more about um, uh, the people and the partners that came together to do that. Uh, and if you're interested in our upcoming classes and workshops and events, uh, head over to our website. It's themuse.org, and that's spelled the-muse.org. You can look at that. Uh, if you want more sooner, stay tuned and join us tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, we will have the poet uh, Bill Ayers is going to be here uh, for a virtual book launch and reading. Uh, be a very a nice treat for everyone. Uh, he's going to be reading from his new book, What Passes for Wisdom. So please uh, stay tuned tonight at 7 p.m. and we would uh, love to have you uh, join us again. Again, thank you, uh, Louisa, January, uh, uh, and uh, Ross. So we really appreciate your time this evening and everything that you were willing to share with us. And uh, again, thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, stay creative, and uh, have a wonderful night. Thank you. <laughs>